can you tell us a, a little bit about the new staging system that's coming in the very near term? So I think the, the first important thing to say is that the old staging system um, retains a lot of um, prognostic power in the HPV negative patients, but there had been a number of um, first in institutional series and then database uh, derived papers which had demonstrated that for HPV positive patients, um, the, the cure rate for stage 4A and stage 4B disease remained quite high and, and, and the staging system was not useful and I, I think probably many people watching this video will have had the experience of a head and neck cancer patient saying, what do you mean I have stage 4 disease and, and you're saying, no, 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 you're, <laughs> you're highly <laughs> curable. <laughs> um, so, so there was a need for uh, a new staging system. The, uh, finding of multiple nodes, uh, which uh, uh, drove the, the N2B designation in the past, has really um, been rendered much less significant in the, in the new staging system. Um, the, uh, so, so the stage four patients will be only those patients with uh, distant disease. The stage three patients will be only those patients with bulky disease, whether that's uh, T4 cancer or N3 cancer. Um, and uh, the uh, data coming both from institutional series and retrospective data uh, do show that this, this significantly outperforms the seventh edition. Um, there, there has been some um, back and forth about whether using only surgical data is appropriate. There's a, a, a paper from Zain Hussein's group that, that uses National Cancer Database uh, information that includes both radiation therapy um, and, and comes up with a very slightly different, uh, different approach. But uh, the overall message is that uh, patients with HPV positive disease can have quite a good prognosis even if they have nodal involvement. Yeah, it, it just didn't align to continue Correct. calling uh, these patients stage four when they were clearly doing as well or even better than stage three patients with HPV negative disease. Okay. So, so I think the eighth edition has, has better aligned that. What other changes uh, are there in the staging system? Uh, Jared, do, do you sure. wanna comment? Well, I think uh, Barbara's hit nicely on the key one, which was downstaging the nodal status of HPV-driven disease, because it's very common with HPV to see these l large cystic nodes that don't convey the negative prognosis. To my mind, the second biggest change was um, adding extra capsular extension into the staging uh, system. Um, this was done for upstaging of N1 uh, nodes um, with extra capsular extension to be N2A and upstaging um, uh, multiple nodes with extra capsular extension to actually be N3B. Um, and there was some data at ASCO looking at um, to what extent this really affected prognosis and what it showed was that for um, multiple nodes being upstaged, it was clear that there was a big difference in prognostic uh, prognosis between those groups. It wasn't clear for a single small node uh, whether that difference really uh, was as critical. But I think you know extra capsular extension in our practice um, already influences us in terms of what we're going to do more towards a chemo rad strategy. There isn't a study to cite that I can think of to say that, but we all say, look, if there's ECE present, we know that if we do a surgical approach that we're going to have to do chemo rads after. And so sort of in more of a common sense direction than perhaps a data-driven way, I think we're all doing mostly the same thing with those patients anyway, which is that we're giving them chemo rads and perhaps whatever we perceive to be our most aggressive chemo rads, be that bolus cisplatin or clinical study. I, I, just in terms of, of where the data come, I, I, I do think that there were older studies and perhaps they weren't entirely IMRT era driven studies, but that demonstrated that patients who needed three modalities were more likely to be feeding tube dependent than patients sure. who, who only got two. And, and so when you think, you, you know, you're sparing them maybe one week of radiation by doing the surgery up front, but you may be uh, costing them something in their swallowing recovery. So, so our approach uh, is, is quite similar. Yeah, I think we always have to keep in mind with these patients that, uh, of course, cure is paramount, but we also want people to try to return to as normal a function as possible. And I would say and that that's the key way to phrase it, right? It's not... Uh, for example, laryngectomy-free survival, it's how are you talking, right? It's uh, uh, how are you eating, how are you talking, what is function? And you see a change in clinical trial design um, towards, uh, 
towards doing just that. Does, does and, and, I, and I think in, and I think in our in our tumor boards as well, you hear this more being a part of the conversation. You know, on the one hand, um, radiation uh, is not all homogenous. Right, um, it's probably between about 50 and 70 gray. If you look at historic data, that you have the steepest difference in affecting constrictor muscle uh, function uh, and influencing larynx function. On the other hand, these are the same patients for whom we have newer surgeries that might uh, transoral approaches that might do better. So I think you know it comes down with all of this complication of the biology of the stage of these different modalities. It comes down to a, a conversation often. Um, where what's important is having the right experts in the room talking about both probability of cure and probability of different functional um, outcomes after. And a lot of this comes down uh, to that more than an absolute answer that you could sort of write out on a table and, and, and put in a review article or something. And Josh, yeah, uh, how, I think tell us that, a little bit about how, how you're perceiving this and, and the changes. Yeah, I think one of the things that the findings from the retrospective series showing the lack of predictive, a lack of prognostic role for the old staging system and HPV positive that was most alarming was the line that shows that the survival for stage one was the same as for A. That's hugely problematic. <laughs> and it really points to the differential biology. Um, but I think that what we're really at is the infancy of understanding how to apply these biomarkers to these patients. Um, and I think that uh, what I hope we'll have in the future is a staging system that is based on uh, more eloquent science than the node was, you know, tumor was busting out of the node. That's bad, right? I mean, like, I think that we can get to a better level of understanding these patients. Um, and I think that that is clearly the next step for these patients. And wouldn't it be nice to have a staging system with breakpoints that tell you what to do instead of just the prognosis uh, of your patient? Right, and, and so the other thing is that how do we apply with this new staging system? How do we apply that to our management, right? We know that from the large studies in chemo radiation that ECS, positive surgical margins, are associated with benefit from chemotherapy. The inclusion of P16 positivity in those studies was limited. Um, so how do we apply that data to patients with P16 positive disease, and how do we? So, so, so I actually, um... I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a staging system that, that's going to have what you just mentioned, the instructions, because I think that the, the, the management is, is changing. Um, you know, our, our approach to head and neck cancers, after many decades of not changing all that much, I think has, has become extremely dynamic.